Probably the biggest difficulty with a groom speech is who to leave out. The classic mistake for a groom is to shoehorn far too many people, events, detail into a speech and then it all unravels into half an hour of your life you'll never ever get back. In some cases, a lot worse than that. So it needs to be an exercise in efficiency. Who to leave out? Number one, leave out anyone that you've paid uh, for a service. It doesn't matter how well you got on with them. Uh, when you're planning and prepping the wedding, next week they will not remember your name. So florists, drivers, wedding planners and all those people, they can hit the cutting room floor. When it comes to um, not so much leaving people out but being efficient with things, is if you've got lots of people who have travelled various distances to be there, do not name them all um, individually or you'll be there all day. Exactly the same when it comes to those who are no longer with us. Don't be tempted to read out every single one, especially if you're an older couple getting married and you've got quite a few people who aren't there. It could take quite some time to get through absent family and friends, and that could be a little bit awkward in a celebratory wedding speech. And apart from that, it's just condensing all the people that you think you need to include, condensing them in such a way that they, they play an important part, but they play a really efficient part. So when it comes to the grooms and our ushers and the best man, be super efficient in how you're describing what they mean to you and maybe some funniness around your relationship. So many times I see just as many words written about the best man as the groom writes about the bride and that is way off. You should be concentrating firmly on the person you have just married. So that's my advice for being efficient in a groom speech. I think probably the... Um, Easily one of the most irritating forms of communication in a easily one of the most irritating forms of communication at a wedding is a poem or a song. Uh, songs, well, we can put them to one side for a minute because there are very few people who can sing and play the guitar or piano at the same time. So they are a very rare subset of people who trouble very few weddings. Thank goodness. But then you have poems. Now most people who have some kind of school certificate in English think they are a part-time poet and all it is you know is a case of rhyming couplets all the way through for eight minutes. This is torture by verse. There's nothing worse than an amateur poet. Only Pam Ayres managed to make a living out of it and that was nearly 50 years ago. Do not be tempted to think that the easiest way out of a best man's speech, and this is what you're looking at it as an easy way out, is to come up with an eight-minute poem. By the second minute everyone's losing the will to live and by minute four everybody wants to kill you. Apart from that you don't really get a feeling of, of who the guy is and what he's about and there's no real room for funniness. You might have a little odd line there but nothing really, really funny or insightful about who he is. Please, whatever you do, if you're thinking of a poem, you really can't help yourself, limit it to literally four lines and then get back with being a normal, sensible human being. Grooms, uh, I write uh, probably just as many two best man speeches uh, as I do just a singular best man speech. And now uh, we have the advent of three best men. I've written for up to 15 best men, which is frankly quite ridiculous. I thought the two best men were quite ridiculous at one point. But this brings me to my point. If you are a groom who has to insist on having two or more frequently now three best men, think about what you're doing to those people. You're making uh, their lives pretty tricky for uh, an extended period of time. Two best men, three best men, getting them all to agree to everything is just not gonna happen. Getting them all to sort of be into it and motivated isn't gonna happen. I come across this time and time again. For two best men, you'll get one who's super motivated, one who wants to wing it on the day. And it always ends up being really, really awkward. Apart from anything, if they do get together and they haven't, you know, they've managed to cobble a speech together, it all ends up becoming some bloated epic that um, they outstay their welcome and it's the worst possible ending to the speech or even worse they do individual speeches and I have heard of two individual best men both speaking for 45 minutes each. Apart from anything I think it's slightly self-obsessed but then you, it's completely up to you. If you want people talking about you in individual speeches I think your priorities are should be uh, indeed elsewhere. So if you've got two best men you want one to do the stag, one to do the speech, finished. Almost certainly, uh, the, one of the biggest traps for any type of wedding speech, so maid of honour, bride, groom, best man, father of the bride, is talking about yourself. People cannot help it. I received lots of answers in 
uh, for all different types of speeches. And by far and away, most people will spend much more talking about themselves than they will about the groom or indeed uh, the person they're marrying. So you've really got to focus on this. Uh, and especially with best men, I will receive lots of stories that come through and I have to indicate back to the best man that I'm writing for that those stories aren't about the groom, they are about you, the best man. Uh, and it's not a great look talking about yourself in a speech that's meant to be about somebody else. So it's really, really important here to focus. And I see it with fathers of the bride and also with grooms. Grooms will um, end up talking about where they've been on holiday, the jobs they have. I even had one groom that wanted me to put the URL of his wife's bit, uh, business in the uh, speech. So if you find yourself with that spotlight moving away from who you should be talking about, just stop. If anything that you, look, you can see is the focus is, is you, not the groom, not the bride, then stop. I come across it time and time again. Do not be one of those victims because everyone will be talking about it after the speeches and not in a good way. I have spoken about speeches before the meal many times, but actually not for quite a few years. And uh, I thought I should say something uh, more about it because I'd like to have a personal campaign to nip it kind of in the bud before it becomes a phenomenon. Uh, speeches before the meal are possibly one of the biggest mistakes you can make when you have got wedding speeches uh, to, uh, to make. Um, Nobody will have drunk enough. Nobody will have been relaxed enough. Chances are they'll be standing somewhere and not in actually where they're having the wedding breakfast. Or if they're having the wedding breakfast, they haven't got time to settle in and, you know, get some vino down them and, and as I said, really start to relax and enjoy. If you do it the conventional way and make them after the meal, everyone will be well-oiled, everyone will be really receptive, everyone will be relaxed and your speech will be a great hit. The reason why people um, want to have them before the meal is that they're, you know, super nervous and want to get it over and done with and enjoy the meal. You really are think, you know, thinking about things in the most counterproductive way. It's a speech. Nobody's asking you to fight for your life. It's a speech, so just relax. Decades and decades of, of people have gone before you managing to make it to the other end of the meal, uh, and you can be one of those people, and it will be far and away the biggest favour you can do yourself. So if you want your speeches to be a real hit, then wait till after the meal. If you want to enjoy your meal and for your speeches to be slightly all right, then by all means, have them before. I often have uh, telephone calls from uh, best men who are one of a set of two best men. Uh, and they frequently ask me what they should be doing. How should they be playing the situation? Now, this um, is normally exacerbated by the fact that the groom will choose one friend from one section of his life and another best man from another section of his life. So chances are they don't know each other very well. That presents a myriad of problems. Um, so the communication between them won't be great. Chances are they're going to have very different views on how to go about this. Uh, at, very frequently, one will be um, really, really motivated to, to get things done. The other one will be slightly more relaxed and thinking they can wing it on the day. So if you are uh, a, a best man as part of two, Firstly, look after yourself. Look after number one. Work out if you can do business with the other best man. And that really means getting together regularly in order to nail down a speech and not only nail down a speech, also go through it and rehearse it properly because you don't want it to be sort of the day before the wedding. If that doesn't look like happening and you've got to be really honest and ruthless about this, then you've got to go for a separate speech. And if you go for a separate speech, get on first. Uh, the last uh, man standing gig is not the one you want to find yourself in because if the first best man has made uh, an absolute a botch up of it, then nobody's going to be interested in you. And if the, uh, if the first best man has been really, really funny, nobody is going to be interested in you. So um, it's a really hard gig, that last man uh, standing. So make sure you get on first. Uh, and then you don't have to worry about doubling up on content, you know, the stories or anything else. Uh, that is all yours. The man who follows you will have that problem, not you. So my advice, as ruthless as it sounds, is look after yourself and get on first. Uh, very frequently these days, um, I write for uh, weddings, uh, wedding speeches in different cultures, uh, different um, ethnicities. 
very frequently these days, I write for guys who are uh, getting married or find themselves best men in uh, a foreign land, in different languages and cultures. Uh, and that's fantastic. Long may that continue. But you have to work out what the best thing to do with your speeches is in that situation. Now, I always say that if um, you've got at least 50% English speaking and they're used to the, the culture of speeches, then make your speech in English. That's um, number one. Um, if you're looking at Latin American countries and most of Central Europe, they haven't got an appetite or understanding for speeches. So you've got to make sure your speech is super efficient. Um, um, I would be talking speeches of around six to seven minutes because they will get very bored very quickly. Also, what I like to do is if you're making it um, in a, a, a place where the um, first language isn't English, straight at the top, get something in there in their language that brings them on board and just basically says in a really funny way, bear with me, I'm a best man, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, have a goodbye to them in their language. That, that way they feel included, they know that you are thinking about them. Uh, um, but do not be tempted to have a running translation uh, um, with um, speeches. That is route one to disaster. You're going to just drag it all out for everyone and both the English speaking and non-English speaking uh, parts of the, uh, you know, the audience are not going to like you. So don't be tempted with that. You can have a printed out sheet um, with your speech in full in Portuguese, Polish, German, whatever it is. And that can be some entertainment whilst you are making your speech. So keep it short, be inclusive and, and, and make sure that you're ingratiating yourself with them. Whatever it is, make sure you let that audience know you are thinking about them. There's a common misconception about best man speeches that they are some kind of stand-up comedy routine. Now, I always like to say uh, that the uh, most dangerous type of wedding speaker is the one that firmly believes they've turned into Jimmy Carr for the afternoon. Nobody wants a stand-up comedian. People are looking for a relatable, funny take on who the groom is and what makes him him. And I've had a couple of comments recently um, from guys in America who say that absolutely in no way should the uh, best man speech be funny. Now, that's your take on it. Absolutely fine. Uh, but it should be funny, uh, and it should be funny in just the right measure. The reason why you've got humour in a speech, a best man speech, is to balance out the profound things you're going to be saying about the groom. It's your opportunity to stand up uh, and let everyone know exactly what he means to you, what a great guy he is, uh, in a very meaningful way. And if you were to do that without any humour, particularly in the British Isles, people are going to think you're having some kind of emotional breakdown. That's why you have the humour in there to break, to break it all up, to give it some balance. It's true that in America, they tend to, tend to not always, tend to go much more for the emotions rather than the, uh, the humour, but you play it on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. So yes, you do have humour in there, but don't think you've turned up into a stand-up comedian. It's a happy medium between the two. And the father of the bride speech is an amazing opportunity to stand up and let everyone know exactly what your daughter means to you and to other people. And there's a huge temptation, uh, particularly if your daughter has gone to um, a, you know, an amazing university, has an amazing career, has scaled Everest and reinvented the atom or whatever it is, uh, to list her accomplishments and achievements in date order. And some people are tempted to go down that route and some people do go down that route and it's never a wise idea. The chances are that most people there will have a rough idea that your daughter is quite an amazing person. Uh, and so the last thing that they want or need is to be taken through it by the hand, uh, detailing her, uh, her triumphs. As with everything uh, to do with wedding speeches, less is more. A subtle approach to celebrating her success will be a lot more powerful than going into granular detail. So if you find yourself actually listing the grades and the year, and the university, um, then I would just stop. And I would just think of a much more broader way to uh, include all those accomplishments, uh, but much more subtly. So that's my advice for not making your father of the bride speech uh, a CV or resume in spoken form.
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Right, cool. Let's have a check the gate.